Yes. Uh, hello and welcome to this quickie session. And everything went black. I said, oh, we waited too long. <laughs> okay. Uh, welcome again. Uh, today I want to show you the first few steps you could take if you want to have a look at the bytecode and which application would be better th uh, for that than Hello World. And as it turns out, as we will have a look at both Java and Kotlin, both languages produce one heck of a different bytecode to achieve the same results even in the simple application. So right uh, at the beginning, I'm a little bit curious who out of this room has already taken a look at the Java bytecode of Hello World? Okay. And who did the same for Kotlin? Nobody. Uh, well, I hope this session has some interesting findings for you then. Um, <laughs> I'm actually a little bit surprised, but before we get started, a few words about myself. I'm Simon Schell, seven years developer at the Provincial Rheinland and also co-founder of my own little start uh, startup last year. But most of the time you will find me working with Java, Kotlin, and TypeScript. So this is also the reason this session came to be. And I probably don't have to explain the role of bytecode to most of you, so I've kept it short. It works as an intermediary for our high-level programming languages to the low-level instructions on the JVM. And what would be the first step if we want to have a look at it? Well, we can just use the JDK package tool Java P to have a uh, look at the output of our class files. And this would then look a little bit like this. So as you can see, in, uh, this is the output directory of an IntelliJ project where I have some classes. And just by uh, using the Java P command, I can get a compact overview of the bytecode instructions, or if I want to, which we will use later on, I can also have a verbose one, including uh, the constant pool and other instructions. And yeah, scrolling doesn't work this way, so I will stick with the slides. I don't know what's wrong there. But um, anyway, if we uh, take a look at the output right at the top, you will find your uh, class, hello world, with the major version of the bytecode you're looking at. In this case, I'm using major version 55, which is the one packaged with JDK 11. But the Kotlin examples are in major version 52, so some differences are to be expected from the get-go. And some of the instructions you will see later on are, for example, a lot zero, which simply loads the first local variable on the stack, or the instruction LDC, which loads a constant from the constant pool, in this case from entry number nine. So taking a look at the Java example, everybody here has already seen this. I would be su uh, surprised if not. So why even have a look at it? Well, the reason is simple, because uh, even here, we can already um, have a look at what we want to find in our bytecode. We have our class declaration, which means we also expect to find a default constructor. We have our main method, and as we can see in our main method, we have a system out print stream and the hello Java string, uh, which we want to output. So, having a look at the bytecode, I would recommend you to look at the constant pool first, because you can already find some of the things we want to search for right at the uh, beginning of the constant pool. And in this case, I've uh, kept it short, because even a Hello World application has already over 30 entries in the constant pool, so uh, you might be surprised when you uh, look that up for the first time. And the entries we want to have a look at are entries number one, two, three, four, and six. Number two and four 
are the field ref for our system out print stream and the method ref of print line, which we invoke in it. Number three is our string containing the literal at entry number 23, hello Java. So we've already found pretty much everything our system out print line code contains. But why also take a look at number six and number one? Well, number six is simply object or superclass, but number one is the method ref of the object init method. And as some of you might know, um, if you create a new object with the new keyword, the object isn't actually uh, already valid when, when it is created. It still needs to be initialized. And this is the method ref uh, which is invoked for that. So this one we can find uh, right there at the top uh, in our default constructor where we have the aload zero instruction uh, to load the this reference and invoke then the initialization of the object as I've said with entry number one the object init method ref. The main method on the other end is uh, pretty straightforward. We, have a, uh, we get the static field of the print stream, we load our constant, and we invoke the print line method on it. So far, so good. Not outstandingly surprising, but interesting enough by itself. So why should we stop there? We can do the same in Kotlin, and it's just as easy. So first things first, uh, I have to mention that you can write Hello World several ways in Kotlin, so I have kept it down to two examples and as you can see this one is pretty close as it still has the arcs parameters and our system out print stream um, but uh, the main difference is in this case we have a Kotlin file so we don't have any class declaration and this works fine in Kotlin so if we take a look at the list of things we expected from our Java example well, we have a class declaration, default constructor, main function, string literal, print stream, and object in it. But uh, main function, string literal, and print stream were still visible. The other three were not. So what happens with them? For those of you who might have gotten excited that we won't find a class declaration, I got bad news. Uh, Kotlin will generate one for us. But this uh, generated class does have some in interesting features because it leaves away both the default constructor and the object in it and is therefore not initializable. So where do we find our uh, bytecode this time around? Well, in case we have a Kotlin file instead of a class, the Kotlin compiler notices uh, that we still need one and uh, generates one for us with the suffix kt as a name. And this is also the, the name of our class files in this case. And if we first take a look at this, uh, you might be surprised to find out that in this case, the constant pool is over 50 entries long, all for the sake of a Hello World application. But why? Well. If we scroll further down, we can see our main culprit right at the bottom of our output. One giant runtime visible annotation, the infamous metadata annotation. So who out of this room working with Kotlin already knows that annotation? Nobody? Uh, is anybody here working with Kotlin? Ah, OK, some. Uh, uh, yeah. Then, um, keeping in short, um, the metadata annotation uh, contains, as the name suggests, several metadata about the file. And uh, one example would be the entries number 38 and 39 I've taken out, which is the metadata kind. And this two as a value translates to the metadata kind of file which is one of the flags responsible for the Kotlin compiler to generate our class because it knows, hey, we only have a Kotlin file instead of a Kotlin class, and we have to work differently with this. So going to our actual instructions, we can see, as I've already mentioned, we don't have any default constructor, and 
therefore own, uh, also no uh, object initialization. And uh, we see some additional stuff. Um, for example, the alot0 uh, function uh, instruction travel to our main uh, method. But you have to be careful in this case because uh, you always have to look at the scope uh, and the stack frame you are right now on. And in this case, the alot0 uh, instruction doesn't load the this reference but instead the args array. And then invokes the uh, parameter is not null check on it, uh, which is one of the Kotlin intrinsics, which uh, the Kotlin compiler includes for you to uh, assure the null safety. So the rest is pretty much the same. We uh, still get our field, load the constant and invoke print line. So to shake things up a little bit before we are finished, Here's the second example. And as you can see, this time around, we leave away uh, the arcs in the signature and uh, also use the Kotlin intrinsic uh, print line function instead of using our system out print stream. And those changes are reflected on bytecode level, first off, by using a proxy method which simply invokes our own uh, main method. And as you can see, in this case, uh, which is, by the way, at the bottom, um, we have no check parameter is not null um, check because the Kotlin compiler notices it's completely irrelevant in this case. So um, we then go to our main function and the print line function, uh, on the other hand, still invokes the system out print line, but for some reason I can't explain, it also loads a single constant zero uh, before actually invoking it. And if anybody of you got a clue why this zero is included, especially because it's never used elsewhere, um, I would be very happy to hear about this. So, what's the main point of this talk? Well, as you can see, even a simple Hello World application already has pretty uh, much to find in the internal magics of both languages. And the direct comparison between both allows you to uh, find out what, this, uh, what the simple instructions do and where the differences lie, and also to find out uh, differences like, for example, the null check or the concept behind it for the language. And you can bet you can also do that with uh, the stuff that's included to Java because it was successful in Kotlin. For example, I would love to have a comparison bef uh, between record and data class as soon as I can. So. I hope this was helpful for you and uh, you can also take, uh, take away these steps to try it out yourself. So if you've liked it, please give me a rating. Thank you for your attention and if you got any questions or want to see the slides which also include the notes and explanations in the uh, comments, you can find them in this GitHub repo and See you later.